Hello, everybody. It's great to see this many people for the last session of the two-day summit. I know it's been a long couple of days for everyone. Hopefully, you've gotten energized by the information we've been sharing with you. I'm Mark Smith. I'm a solutions architect manager, and my team supports the federal customer set. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about AWS Compute. We're going to cover a couple of different things. Uh, we're going to do an overview about some recent developments in the EC2 platform since reInvent because there have been some significant changes that I think it's important for everyone to be aware of, and especially with respect to the innovation on the EC2 platform. And then we're going to spend the second half of the presentation talking about other ways to do compute within AWS. So one of the key things that's important for customers to appreciate that AWS puts a heavy emphasis on innovating the platform. Back in 2011, we had 80 new features and capabilities brought to the platform. By 2016, we had added 1,017 significant new features and capabilities. That's a 12-fold improvement in those six years. It's also important to realize that those innovations are driven by the people in this room. 90% of these features and capabilities come from suggestions from our customers. And on any given year, about 35 to 40% of these features actually have a security focus, which gives you an idea how important security is at AWS. So those of you who've been around a while might recognize this blog entry. This goes all the way back to August 26, 2006. And it was done by Jeff Barr, who is our main blogger at AWS. And in this blog entry, he introduces EC2. So back then, the state of the art was a 1.7 gigahertz processor with uh, 1.75 gigabytes of RAM, 160 gigabytes of local disk for the amazing price of 10 cents an hour. This was the state of the art. So hold those numbers in your head because you're going to compare them to some other numbers I'm going to introduce you to with our instance families today. Now, when we look at EC2, right, it's actually broken into these what we call instance families. The general purpose families are comprised of the T2 class and the M4. And the T2 is known as our burstable class. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but just can I see a show of hands of how many people use the T2s in their environment today? Looks like a few of you use T2s. So if, um, if I could stress something, and I'm not going to do too much of this, the T2 is an awesome platform to be on. Um, it's one of those instance classes that punches above its fighting weight because it bursts to higher capacity than when you need it. So definitely um, encourage you to take a look at, at T2s. One of the most um, popular instance classes is the M4, right? So that has a balance of compute and memory. Next is the C instance class, which has multiple different um, families in it. Uh, the newest one that's coming out in a little bit is C5. And it has more compute capability than memory. The IO uh, storage and optimized instance class is the instance class that has a lot of direct attached SSD for high performance disk uh, for those workloads that need it. Then there's the R and X class, which is about memory optimized. These are instance classes that actually have more memory than they do compute. Some of them have a lot more memory, as we'll see a little bit later. And lastly is the accelerated instance classes with the F1s, the P2s, and the G2s. And we'll talk a little bit about the F1s and P2s later on. So this chart was interesting because it gives me a sense what's happening with the instance families over time. As you can see, back in 2006, Jeff Barr introduced the M1 small. And as we go forward in time, based on input from the people in this room and other customers, the platform has been innovating. We have more and more instance classes to accommodate the workloads that you're bringing to us. With the introduction of the X1E, which I'm going to talk about briefly, and the C5, this chart pretty much run its course. But it really is a good indicator about what's happened from, uh, from in a time frame perspective. So I'd like to dive into uh, networking a little bit. So when we think about EC2, I see it as a trio of capabilities that come together to form the platform. I'm oversimplifying this a little bit, but it's about networking, it's about disk, and it's about compute. And networking is actually one of the harder areas to extend, right? It's not easy to actually just stack up lots of servers to get more uh, bandwidth on your, on your networking. It's a, sort of a finite capability. And one of the things that we found with enhanced networking 
up until last year, we used a chipset called the Intel A255, which was a great chipset. And it did things like network virtualization, which is great for the cloud environment. The problem with the Intel A255 is that it stopped at 10G. And if you look at what's happening with server workloads today, 10G is just the entry point, right? We're actually doing a lot more than 10G, as you see in some of these instance classes. Those of you who have seen uh, James Hamilton's keynote back at reInvent, he introduced um, Annapurna, which is a chipset company that's a subsidiary of Amazon. And Annapurna is actually behind what we call the ENA, the Elastic Network Adapter. And ENA is a new NIC, a new architecture, and new software that it's going to allow us to go up to 400G networking. Now, obviously, we're not going to do 400G this year, but we're already doing 20G, and you're going to see higher than 10, 20G in the near term. What's important to realize is that uh, we did this for the reasons about the people in this room. We knew that for every increment that we went up in networking speed, we couldn't be asking you to update the driver. So by using an open source driver framework, right, we only have to have you install that driver once. And we're going to do all the innovations in the back side to make things go faster. A significant thing that's actually happened, and this actually hasn't gotten a lot of press, it used to be that you actually had to put your servers in something called a placement group. And a placement group was a hint to us saying, hey, I want these servers to talk fast to each other, so get them close enough so they can do the 10G. With the advent of the ENA, a server will do is 20G anywhere within a region. Does anyone uh, know what I have here? Well, in case you can't read it, I can barely. It's a Sumimoto SM3456C. There's 3,456 pieces of fiber in this. And we've installed an immense amount of this fiber to actually make this realization happen. It's, uh, it's amazing. I actually started to count them, but uh, it was actually mindless. Another um, aspect to look at, what's happening with respect to the subsequent generations? So I have three generations of um, enhanced networking here. Um, the C3 8x large used the Intel A259, and it actually topped out at 10G. You look at the M4 16x large, which has the ENA, and you'll notice in the blue line it actually hits 10, uh, 10G also. And you're like, what's going on? Well, what's happening behind the scenes is we're actually we're, we're allocating 10G per TCP flow to get to the 20G with these newer server classes. And this is important, right? So I just to set the right expectations. You actually have to benchmark with multiple TCP flows. Once you actually do more than one, you'll see that the M416X-Large will hit 20G on you. The key thought is, is that this is a starting point for us. And the other large servers that I'm going to review today all have enhanced network adapters. They all have the ENA. And that investment is a worthwhile investment for us to make sure that you, as our customers, have the right experience when you're running EC2. So let's take a look at this for a second. So EBS is the SAN service, right, the SAN storage that you actually use provision against your um, EC2 servers. And I decided to go back and look at our documentation exactly three years ago, back in 2014. And this really surprised me. I hadn't done this exercise before. But we've actually increased the IOPS, right, the IOs per second, 4x, from 16,000 to 75,000. We've actually increased the throughput of the fastest server classes, right, taken both in 2014 to 2017, by 7x. This is remarkable. You know, for me, that's just amazing that we're actually putting that much of this into our data centers to make these types of changes possible. Let's talk a little bit about instance classes and some of the changes that have happened since reInvent. So the R3 series, this is the high memory series, is great for things like high performance computing, distributed memory caches, memory analytics, and geome um, analysis. Since reInvent, we actually have introduced the R4, where we have two times the memory, the DDR access is twice as fast. The L3 cache is almost doubled in size. And we've doubled the vCPU count. Interestingly enough, when we do this, we charge less. If you look at an R3 large versus an R4 large, 
It's less expensive. So you go faster for less money. And this is the trend that we do with the other instance classes also. In the I2, let me see a show of hands. Who uses I2s in here? They use very specific workloads. So a couple of people. OK. So the I2 is the instance class that I was telling you about that actually has a lot of direct attached SSD. Great for NoSQL databases, Hadoop workloads, cluster file systems. This is a mind-blowing number, 3.3 million IOPS. Those are IOs per second. It's a startling 9x improvement from one generation to the next using NVMe drives. We doubled the memory. We've more than doubled the amount of storage that's attached to servers. And again, we've doubled the number of vCPUs. So you can see how we're just working so hard to move the platform from forward for customers' workloads. C4, again, uh, another um, highly used instance class within AWS. Uh, this is the one that actually has more of a compute bent than memory. And it's great for things like web servers and batch processing and distributed analytics. And the C5 is just about to come out based on the Skylake processor. It's going to have the AVX 512 instruction set. So that's a new set of instructions, right? And those instructions are based, are going to let you do things like faster scientific modeling, 3D rendering, cluster computing, and cryptography. Again, we've doubled the number of CPUs. The EBS is dramatically improved, 12 gig versus 4 gig. And we've more than doubled the memory. These are actually coming out really soon. Uh, the X1, this is a beast of the machine. This actually came out last September, September 29th, if I remember correctly. And I remember um, within the SA community that we were all anticipating this coming out because it had a 20, 128 vCPUs. It's just an immense box, 20 gigabit network, 10G EBS, and two terabytes of memory. Now, not many of you might have workloads that need this, but a lot of customers do. These were built for SAP HANA workloads principally but they're also very important for things like genomic analysis and machine learning. And these get a lot more work than you might guess. They just came out, but the X1E was just introduced. So Jeff Barr wrote about this last week, where we've actually doubled the amount of memory. We've done 1.4x on the EBX, uh, on the EBS throughput. And we have eight terabyte and 16 terabyte versions of this just around the corner. So I think it's really important, the key takeaway with me showing you all this is that we're working very hard to make sure that we're advancing the platform because the innovation in the EC2 platform itself provides innovation for the rest of AWS because the rest of the portfolio rides on the compute platform. Let's talk about accelerated computing. So the P2 came out last year, and it actually has eight, the P216X large has eight of these NVIDIA Tesla cards. Each one of these Tesla cards has two GPUs in it. And that box with the eight cards in it is rated at 70 teraflops. So I'm thinking, you know, that's sort of an abstract number. What does 70 teraflops mean? Well, if you went to the top500.org, which is the website that tracks supercomputing, right, and you go back to 2007, this machine would be in the top 10 of the fastest supercomputers in the world. That's how much compute we're talking here, right? And this is what you can have at your fingertips by dialing it up in the console. Conversely, there's another um, high-speed, high-performance compute capability called the F1 FPGA. FPGAs, right, are, stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And it's based on the Xilinx chipset. Again, this is a very powerful compute capability, distinctly different than the Intel platform. And it's not unusual to see like a 30x improvement in performance by using this chip platform. Now, I'm going to show you um, an example where even 30x was low. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So how do these different compute platforms work? Well, I'm just going to touch on this at a high level. But your Intel CPU largely works in a serial fashion, right? It's actually executing uh, instructions in a serial fashion. There is a bit of parallelism in there, but it's largely serial. And your instructions are 32-bit or 64-bit instructions. And your data width is 64 or 32-bit. The GPU works differently. The, P2, the P216X large has nearly 40,000 of these GPU cores in it. It's an immense number, right? It's a lot of little processing cores that are working very fast to do integer and floating point math. So if you chop up your problem and dispatch it to these GPUs, which have their own designated memory, you're going to get some performance. 
That's why these things go so fast. The FPGAs are a completely different beast altogether. They don't have an instruction set. They have logic gates. And essentially what you do is you take your algorithm and you map that into logic gates using the software tooling. And the interesting thing about it, there's more than 2 million of these cells on a, a F1 chipset, of which there's eight in the uh, F1 um, extra large, that you don't have just one execution path. Because there's so many of these cells, you can make as many as the execution paths as you need. The data paths actually change in width also. You're not restricted to 32 or 64. It's depending on the size of your data. And these things fly. I'll give you a couple of examples here. So I've met with uh, Rift Cloud. They're local. They're up in, in Gaithersburg. They actually have a plugin to Elasticsearch. And what that plugin does is when you do an Elasticsearch query, it hands it off to an F1 and it will do log analysis for you 91 times faster than a C4 8x large. Turn that on its head, you need 91 C4 8x larges to keep up with an F1. Yeah, pretty remarkable. So just from a cost perspective, it makes sense to look at the F1 series because they're so fast. But they can also solve problems which normally would require a cluster of 100 or hundreds of um, Hadoop nodes to do the log analysis. If you need to go fast, if you're in a crunch and you need to look at your log files and find information quickly, this should be one of your candidates that you look at. Edico actually does something interesting. It seems like a non sequitur to me to take the word real time and put it with, real, uh, with gene analysis. But that's actually what they've done. The F1 is so fast that they do genomic analysis in real time. These are workloads that typically take hours or days. And the F1s are actually doing these um, updates in near real time. And lastly, to make the F1s more approachable, right, there's Falcon Computing and their Merlin C++ to FPGA cross-compiler. So you can take existing C++ code, you don't have to be an FPGA expert, and cross-compile an FPGA and get off and running. The, the key point is, is that there's several partners, actually many partners, that are working with the F1s, doing great work. I encourage you to go to our website and see what they're doing because it'll greatly accelerate your ability <laughs> to leverage the platform. So we've talked a little bit about the EC2 platform itself and some of the new things that are there. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about other ways to do compute. So we're going to back up a little bit, and let's talk about the three ways that come to mind to me. There's virtual machines that probably everyone in this room is familiar with and runs their workloads with. There's containers. When I'm talking about containers, I'm principally talking Docker. And there's serverless. Now, over the past two days, I think there's probably been at least eight or nine sessions where we've talked about Lambda. And I'm going to talk about Lambda a little bit more, but probably in the context uh, from a slightly different perspective, more of a compare and contrast perspective. So let's dig into this a little bit. So when you think of a virtual machine, its key deployment package, right, is that of an AMI, Amazon Machine Image, that you actually deploy to an instance. You typically would update it by patching, right? So as you need to update a driver or whatnot, you would actually patch it. It's a multi-threaded, multi-task sort of capability, and it typically would run for hours, months, or even years at a time. Now, containers are different. Its unit of packaging is the Docker file itself, typically considered immutable. It's updated by loading up a new version of the Docker file to the platform. It's designed typically to be multi-threaded, but single task. And typically, these would run from minutes to days, but there's nothing to keep you from running these longer than that. Lambda is different also, in the sense that its packaging is the code that you give us to run on your behalf. You update it by putting another version in the console or uh, updating the, the code for your, the CLI. It's designed to be single task and single threaded. And they would run anywhere from microseconds to seconds, even though we have some customers that run these things as long as five minutes, which is the current limit on Lambda. And the key thing about running it on Lambda is you're being charged on the size of Lambda, up to a gigabyte and a terabyte and a half, um, and by the time that you run. So it's actually the size of the Lambda by the time that it runs and the number of them. So let's talk about virtual machines and what do we do with virtual machines to make them so interesting for our customers? Well, there's a suite of capabilities, right? Without this ecosystem, 
virtual machines aren't that interesting in AWS. When you actually have an ELB that can distribute the workload amongst your various servers, that it works together and collaborates with the auto-scaling. So as your servers expand and contract, the ELB keeps track of which servers have um, risen or disappeared in your environment. These run within a VPC, which is your software-defined networking. You actually create a data center within AWS when you define a VPC. And then your data is actually stored in a couple of different ways, right? But the ones I'm going to speak to is EBS that we touched on before, which is the SAN storage for the environment. And RDS, which is a relational database service, which is a variety of different databases that you'd use to store your relational information. So let's unpack a little bit what's, what's going on with containers. So a container is, a, in comparison and contrast with a virtual machine, is a virtualization of the OS. Where a virtual machine right, is slicing up a piece of hardware, a container is actually slicing up a virtual machine. And it's doing this segmentation using Linux namespaces, which does the process isolation. And it's also using things like cgroup to actually constrain the amount of resources each one of these containers uses. And it's, you know, image is actually the Docker image you deploy to servers. And so what are some of the advantages? I think most of the people in the room are probably aware that it's portable, meaning that if you, t if you develop something in your test and dev environment, the same image, typically considered immutable, goes directly into your prod environment. It's fast. So a Docker container deploys in an order of a few seconds. Why? Because you don't have to light off a full OS. You just have to segment out some namespaces and some, some resources for it. It's efficient because you're not actually, again, lighting off an OS and incurring the memory and the CPU overhead of stacking together multiple OSs. And they're flexible because you can use them for things like um, microservices or as your stepping stone to move from infrastructure as a service. So if you're using AWS in an infrastructure as a service fashion today, containers is a logical stepping stone to take you forward. So what customers will see when they work with Docker is that it's pretty straightforward to run a couple containers on top of an image, on top of your local workstation, on top of a server. But when you try to go from this to this, it gets a bit unmanageable. So why? Why do things uh, start to break down? Well, because when you're thinking about the cluster uh, instances, you need to know if that instance that you want to put something on is feeling good. You want to know if the container that you're thinking about replacing is ailing or not. Or there could be an attribute like, well, what availability zone does that server live in? With the open source frameworks, it's a little bit awkward to do some of these things. It's a pain. So these are some of the problems that we're actually we're trying to solve in AWS with ECS. So things like security also are a real problem. Um, when you think about credentials and how do you actually distribute credentials across your containers, this is another problem domain. High availability, whether you're at the um, high availability for the cluster images themselves or the containers needs to be addressed. So these are the problems right, that we've actually put a lot of focus on to bring ECS to our customers. And when you think about ECS, it actually breaks into three discrete capabilities. It's about cluster management, right? The servers that comprise that cluster. It's about container orchestration, meaning like what Docker images get deployed to what servers there. And it's also about deep integration with the other AWS, AWS services. Because if you just had the cluster container management software itself without that integration, it's a lot less interesting. Just as virtual machines are less interesting by themselves without leveraging the other services in AWS. So what are some of these other capabilities that we're talking about? Well, it's about instance auto-scaling. So you can actually have multiple instance types within an ECS cluster. You can have both GPUs and M4s. And they can auto-scale independently as needed as you put containers on them. You can also do container auto-scaling. So if you have um, two containers that are actually doing a web workload for you, they'll, they'll go sideways and contract for you also. So we're actually you know, doing auto-scaling at both the cluster and at the container level. This only works is if you got a load balancer in place that understands where these containers are living. And the new ALB handles dynamic port mapping. 
you actually might have the same web server container on the same instance. If you didn't have the ability to understand that there are multiple ports that are still web ports, um, you'd lose track and your workload wouldn't go to the right place. That's where ALB comes in. IAM might be one of the most important things that ECS does for you. Just as with your um, EC2 instance roles, we propagate IAM credentials into the containers. So let me roll that back. What, what does that mean? That means if you need to make an S3 call, your container has the credentials to securely make that, that call. You don't have to do some sort of crazy secrets management. ECS is helping you there right off the bat. The last thing I'll touch on here in the interest of time is CloudTrail. So one of the best ways to think of AWS, right, at least for, for me, is that we're a very powerful API, that you create infrastructure, you create workloads. And one of the interesting benefits of thinking of it that way is that for every one of those API calls, you can log it. Who, who in the room uses CloudTrail in your environment today? Would you see a show of hands? So, okay. Um, here's the thought. If you're not using CloudTrail today, go home, look at the documentation, and implement CloudTrail. It is like the most awesome gimme that we can give you. Because what it does is it tells you every API call that's made in AWS. You have visibility into your account that you've never had before. You understand when someone changed the security group rule, and if they did it when you didn't want them to do it. You understand where they did it from. It's great for understanding the configuration environment. It's fantastic for securing your environment. It gives you something that you don't have on-prem today. It's such a powerful um, piece of technology that I encourage everyone to look at it. So these are some of the use cases. And just out of curiosity, a, another show of hands, who is looking at containers to are hosting their enterprise workloads? Just a show of hands in here. So, OK, so people are looking at it. In my interactions with the federal customer, it's the third use case, platform as a service, that seems to be getting the most interest today. So customers are looking to get out of the operations of these infrastructure as a service workloads because it's a lot of work, right? Um, there's a lot of care and feeding that goes on. And they like the idea of having a managed you know, um, cluster container management place to actually run these workloads. And you actually heard the cloud.gov team talk about how they use a pass offering to other federal customers. So pass is actually, for me, what I'm seeing uh, most, most commonly when I speak with my customers today. One of the things that makes ECS interesting is giving you this, the flexibility right, and the control to put tasks where you need them. You might need to put your tasks, your containers, on an instance type that has a GPU attached to it. You might want to make sure that your containers are distributed amongst multiple availability zones. You might be looking for a distinct instance type. And when you use these task placement strategies, right, you have this variety of different approaches to make um, these different uh, workloads happen. Bin packing is great for actually cramming a lot of um, containers on a single instance and reducing your, uh, your instance count. Spreading is about distributing your instances um, as you need, whether it be for availabilities, zones, or other um, criteria. And affinity is about making sure that if you deploy a web server container, that your application server container shows up alongside it, right? So don't need to unpack this anymore, but I just, it's not speaking to the control that ECS gives you to work with the platform. So I think one of the things that helps me uh, understand customer adoption is actually see real case studies. And these are customers that have adopted ECS as a platform. One that actually spoke up at reInvent last year with Werner was Netflix. And Netflix is one of our more thoughtful, thorough consumers of AWS technology. They don't take things on casually. And if they don't like something in AWS, they let us know. And if need to, they actually write their own frameworks. But they carefully looked at ECS, and they realized from a container management, from a container clustering perspective, this platform had what they needed. So it, I saw that as a really strong endorsement that I wanted to share with you. There's also this interesting use case. So Mapbox is a mapping provider, and they actually provide mapping services for Foursquare and Pinterest, Evernote, Weather Channel, and Uber, and the Financial Times, if you care for that. And they service 1.3 billion requests a day over these various services, over the 21 services. 
And their infrastructure used to look like this. So their mapping service was on the C4s. Their search service was on R3s. And their direction service was on M4s. And they looked at ECS and looked at container clustering as a way to actually consolidate their platform and reduce costs, because they're working in a competitive environment. And one of the things that they were aware of that was that like, the mapping service used more CPU than it did memory, and the search service used mem more memory than CPU. And they weren't getting the, the efficiency that they were looking for. And when they actually consolidated the workload on ECS, they found that they were able to increase the utilization of the service in both a memory and a CPU perspective up to 80%. That resulted in them using 25 fewer instances. And when you think about a large cluster with multiple instance types, you can see how you can do this for your own workload. Another thing they did, and here there's an example of their architecture with the, distant, with the different instance types categories uh, deployed there, is they're also using Spot Fleet. So with Spot Fleet, you can actually get a 90% discount, up to a 90% discount off our on-demand pricing. In conjunction with the other strategy I just told you about, they're able to reduce their costs running on EC2 by 80 to 90%. Pretty dramatic, right? And this is with um, a tool that actually only takes a few minutes to configure. That's the other thing I'd like to leave you with, is that if you jump into a console, you can actually create your own cluster literally within a couple of minutes. It's so straightforward, it's, it's remarkable. So it isn't just customers that found ECS as an interesting place to put workloads. The AWS batch team, which creates a fully managed batch capability that's designed for dynamic provisioning of batch workloads, decided that ECS was a great candidate for their architecture. So AWS batch is built on ECS today. And it also uses Spot Fleet to reduce your cost um, for running your batch workloads. And you know, AWS Batch will go from anywhere from running a very simple you know, bat, uh, batch script to things like large-scale batch processing, Monte Carlo analysis, ETL, log thinning, right? So it's another one of these capabilities where we've taken something very complex, that's a heavy lift, where we do all the operations and management on the cover to make it easy for you to do your batch processing. So let's touch on serverless. I know everyone's heard about Lambda, but let's review a few things about it, right? No server is easier to manage than no server, okay? It can't get any truer than this. If all you need to do is give us your code and we take care of everything else, how can that get any easier? And that's what Lambda's about. The other piece that Lambda's about is how it um, leverages the other part of our, env our environment. Whether you're using the um, the push approach or the pull approach, other services within AWS can trigger a Lambda. I'll give you an example. Amazon S3 can actually trigger a Lambda on your behalf. If you have a log file that you drop into S3, S3 can be configured to light off a Lambda and process that log file to look for something you know, anomalous and send out an alert about it. And this same paradigm is used over and over within AWS. And the Lambda team keeps pushing the bar, or raising the bar on this, that we keep incorporating other services. So this is probably the single most powerful piece about Lambda that comes to mind to me, is this ability to have other services trigger Lambdas on your behalf. And it actually speaks to how you actually don't have to have infrastructure in place to create some very powerful applications. It also includes the, the integration with something like AWS Config that actually is integrated with CloudTrail. So it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, if you have an administrator that changes the security group at 10 a.m. on a Monday, that could be out of your security policies. With a Lambda, it can actually process that log and flip that security group back for you. That's awesome. That's the AWS config rules. And it's so approachable, it's so um, easy to get at in the console to do this. And just to note that we actually now have C-sharp as a language that was introduced at, um, at reInvent. And let's talk a little bit about serverless security. Like ECS, we make your IAM credentials available to the Lambda, so the Lambda can actually process with secure credentials, which is what allows it to work with the rest of the AWS ecosystem, right? Because it creates those signed API calls. Lambdas can now also live within your VPC. So if you actually have data, whether it be in a database or a cluster file system, those Lambdas can now access that information and process on that. 
We also live within the security boundary that you create with your own security, your networking security for your VBC. So there's this anecdote in the computer industry about pets versus cattle. And it goes like this. So everyone here is familiar with running um, servers on-prem and how they're like your pet. You do everything you can to keep them up and running. You patch them, you secure them, you maintain them. And they get a lot of TLC because they're doing very important work. And then customers start um, adopting the cloud. And they'll be running the same server in AWS. And one of the things that they learn is that they don't need to do all that care and feeding, right? If a server is feeling sick, instead of trying to understand what driver made a server unhappy, you just kill it and light off another one. Now, that's a bit of a brutal paradigm. But what I'm saying is that today, with infrastructure as a service workloads, customers are putting servers out the pasture in ways that they wouldn't have before. With Lambda, there is no pets. There are no cattle. There's only the herd. And what I'm talking about is that you can create very powerful applications with Lambda and one or two other services. You might have heard this in another session that you might have been at the past couple of days. But with just API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB, customers are making immensely powerful modern applications. And the interesting thing is, it's not complex, right? We actually, we're doing all the heavy lifting. We're doing the, the monitoring, the management, the provisioning, the availability of making these services available for you. And all you need to do is take that code fragment and access those services to do what you need. And it isn't like you actually have to access all these services at the same time. All you really need to do is start with Lambda and one or two other servers, services. It could just be Lambda and S3, and you build out from there. You build out its capability. So that's the key thought, right, is that we're moving from this paradigm of pets, which wasn't a lot of fun, right? A lot of us actually lost sleep. I know I lost sleep earlier in my career um, taking care of pets. And um, I'm glad I don't have to take care of pat cattle. The idea of being able to leverage this herd paradigm is refreshing. And you can tell from the uptake with, F with Lambda that many other customers are, are finding it refreshing also. Some examples, and we heard some of these today, is FINRA is processing a half trillion Lambdas a day. Fannie Mae actually did a session here where they talked about processing 20 million loans with 15,000 Lambdas running concurrently in an hour and a half four times faster than the grid platform, the 8,000 core grid platform that they have today. So Lambda is great from going from a very simple event and processing just a single log file that gets thrown into S3 to these very large scale workloads. And it actually works well from the spectrum, right, of capabilities. And we're not the only ones, right, customers are not the only ones figuring out. The other service teams, the AWS, are going, whoa, OK, so Lambda does good things, and we're going to use it. For example, your console sign-ins, or your cloud formation templates, right, or auto-scaling events. You see Lambda being used over and over in AWS today because it's so useful, right? It's so easy to use, and it's so useful. And it also becomes an execution environment for products that you might have heard of over the past couple of days, whether it be Amazon Lex or Greengrass and IoT. Snowball Edge, where you can actually do Lambda processing on a snowball that actually lives in your environment, right? That would be the device that you use to export data in your environment. You can actually do processing with Lambdas as that data is being imported into your snowball. And one last example that's almost about to come out of preview is Lambda at the Edge. And this is a really interesting capability. This is a Lambda execution environment that lives in CloudFront. It's actually at the very edge of our compute. And when an HTTP, request, an HTTP request comes in, you can actually process that header in real time. You can inspect it. You can modify it. So it's very interesting what people are doing with Lambda and what AWS is doing with Lambda. So let's come full circle. We've talked about virtual machines and that most of the people in the room are probably very familiar with running infrastructure as a service workloads. And that's a great way to do compute. But containers makes a great stepping stone, right, to actually moving your compute to an easier way of um, living with the platform. And that serverless takes that paradigm even further so that there isn't even like a server underneath it, right? That Lambda allows you to build very powerful applications with a handful of API calls. 
And to recap what we talked about with the EC2 platform, that we could see that you could actually have um, 30x improvements by using the FPGA, that the EVS performance has gone up almost 7x in the past three years, that we've done things like double or triple the amount of memory in servers. You can see that we're working very hard to make sure that your use cases are being addressed. And that's the second key takeaway I want you to understand is that the innovation EC2 drives the innovation in the rest of the portfolio. So that's all I had for you today. Thank you very much. Um, this blog file, this blog, is Jeff Barr's blog, and it's a great place to get more information about the, uh, the topics I talked about today. Thank you very much.